I'm going to start trying to share my screen and then we should be able to get going. <laughs> Lovely, can everyone see the screen? Yep, perfect. So um, as Anne said, I am Thea Taylor. I head the Sussex Dolphin Project. Uh, we're based in Southwick, just in Shoreham Port. So it's a lovely location. Um, fairly close to all of you guys, I think. So we were initially launched in 2018 um, as the local flagship project of the World Station Alliance. They're the global partnership of marine experts dedicated to research conservation of cetaceans. So they vary from things such as individual researchers to um, teams of people, to well and dolphin watching trips. Um, so kind of anyone and everyone that has an interest in whale and dolphin conservation. I should probably mention that the, world, the word cetacean uh, actually means whales, dolphins and porpoises. So that's the, the technical group name um, for those, those animals. Uh, we started off in Brighton, uh, as that's where the World Station Nights office was. Um, and our first objective really was to um, raise awareness and teach people about the fact that we have dolphins in the Eastern English Channel because nobody really knew. Um, and the fact that no one knew meant that there wasn't any data. Um, so it wasn't being studied. So we decided um, to launch our project. Uh, the Sussex is one of the least studied cetacean habitats, not just in England, actually, but in Europe. Um, so everyone loves studying marine mammals. They are super cool, really intelligent species. Um, but Sussex got overlooked. Um, it's really, really busy area. Um, it's a narrow part of the channel. Everyone assumed that it wasn't very good cetacean habitat. Um, lots of fishing activity. Um, and it's a really busy shipping lane as well. So everyone assumed they'd, they'd go elsewhere. Um, but we actually found looking back through historical anecdotal evidence that um, talking to local fishermen and people that have lived by the coast a long time, um, most of them said that actually there's been dolphins in the channel for as long as they can remember. Um, and when we look at things such as architecture in Brighton, um, actually the coat of arms, if everyone knows what the Brighton Hove coat of arms looks like, it has dolphins on it. Um, so there's all the signs that dolphins um, have been around and actually there's um, an amazing book called The Curiosities of Natural History, which I'm obsessed with, which was written in the early 1800s. Um, and it actually records um, minke whales being in the, East, in the Eastern English Channel um, and porpoises regularly uh, being spotted in pods of 20 up to 100 in Br just off Brighton. Um, so there's always been a lot of rich history here. So we started in this very dark and dingy office on the Brighton seafront. Um, it was a great location for the Discovery Centre. Um, but when we launched our citizen science research projects, we needed a little bit more space um, and somewhere with windows, which is when we moved to uh, Shore and Port. And we're in a lovely office uh, just opposite the E-Mouse e -Mouse charity shop um, in Shore and Port. So we're in there on Mondays and Wednesdays. So if anyone has any questions um, that pop into their head, will be in there. So today we are a little bit um, a little bit broader. We don't just do education. Um, so our three main re uh, focuses are research, awareness and education. Um, and I'm going to go a little bit more mostly into the research side of things today. Um, awareness is doing talks like this for you guys and people that are really interested um, in the topic. And our education, we run school groups, um, get kids down to the beach, down to the conservation corridor, which is on the Shore and Port Canal Bank, um, and go into classrooms and do classroom workshops as well. So we have a really broad approach um, and we will quite happily talk to anyone from two to 102 about the work that we do. So to start with, I'm going to do a little bit about cetaceans, so whales, dolphins and porpoises. Um, so I always find that's quite a good way to start and give people a real sense of uh, why they're so interesting, particularly to fellow mammals as, such as ourselves. So cetaceans are actually the only uh, marine animal that evolved to live fully on land and then evolved to live back in the water again. So most things have either evolved to live on land and stayed here or kind of been a little bit in between such as seals 
but cetaceans are the only group of animals that completely came out and then decided don't like it out here and went back in. So the little mouse like animal down the bottom, that is a pachycetus. And that is what whales, dolphins and porpoises used to look like uh, millions of years ago when they lived on the land. Um, there's a couple of distinctive features that we can use to tell that they were um, mammals and they used to have lower limbs and walk about on land. They actually have on this diagram towards their tail, you can see there's a little yellow thing that's floating around that has no use whatsoever. That's their residual pelvis. So that's actually the, the remains of the pelvic bone that's just floating around. They haven't lost it yet. Um, if you look at the structure of the flippers, although they're slightly disjointed, they're the same bone structure as our hands, uh, which is really, really cool. And also they breathe air, they're warm blooded. Um, they give birth to live young and produce milk, same as other land dwelling mammals. So in order to adapt to life back in the ocean, I'm sorry, the arrows on here are slightly off center. Um, I don't quite know what's happened there. Um, they have a couple of adaptations. So this is the head of a uh, bottlenose dolphin. Um, the most obvious adaptation for living in the water is the blowhole, which is migrated from the nose up to the back of their head. Um, and obviously this enables them to keep their head in the water while they come up to the surface to breathe. Uh, the melon, which is the blue organ, which is in front of that blowhole, enables them to use echolocation. Um, like sonar to be able to see where they're going. So dolphins and porpoises can actually see in, in pitch black water by using this echolocation. So they emit clicks from the uh, phonic lips or the monkey lips um, just below the blowhole. And the sound is directed through that melon, which makes it really narrow and sharp. And then they detect the sound bouncing back off um, their surroundings or their prey through their lower jaw. Um, and into the, the green organ that you can see um, towards the back of the lower mandible. Um, and that's the acoustic window. So that translates it kind of into a picture. Really, really cool adaptation. Um, so we think that they can actually use echolocation now and they can actually see what the others are seeing. So they can read each other's echolocation, super cool. I won't go into it because I'll be talking about it for hours. <laughs> um, and as I said, they're warm blooded. So um, they have a, a really thick layer of blubber um, over their muscles and that keeps them warm. Um, and that's one of the reasons why um, when you look at dolphins that are um, adapted to live in colder climates, particularly if you compare our bottlenose dolphins to bottlenose dolphins in the tropics, you'll notice they're a lot chunkier. And they quite often have a bit of a double chin, which is, which is cute. Um, but they use that in order to keep themselves warm in the colder waters. Uh, the ecology and diet, we have to do a little bit of guesswork on the ecology, on the diet of our Sussex cetaceans, because we don't know that much about them. They're still really understudied. Um, we use most of the data from dolphins from the Bay of Biscay and up in Scotland, we assume they're similar habitats, similar dolphins. Um, so we get quite a good um, idea of that. They do have a very varied diet. Um, but all the ones that we get in Sussex are fish eaters. We don't have any um, dolphins that eat other, other dolphins or seals. Um, so data shows that they eat fish such as um, cod, whiting and pollock, so schooling fish, pelagic fish, but they also supplement their diet, particularly in the winter when they head offshore into deeper waters um, with things like squid um, and cuttlefish as well. Uh, which is, uh, allows them to, to keep going and not have to move so much in the winter. So a little bit more broad information. Ooh. Uh, globally, there are 42 species of dolphin and seven species of porpoise, and there is a difference. So porpoises aren't just small dolphins, they're actually a whole different taxonomic group. Um, but visually, the best ways to tell is porpoises are always a lot smaller than dolphins. Um, they're quite chunky, they have little or no beak, so they just have a, a rounded face. And if you get close enough, um, they don't have cone-shaped teeth of the dolphins, they have kind of flat spade-shaped teeth. Um, killer whales, that aren't whales, are the largest dolphin, 
and we do occasionally get them passed through the English Channel, which is very cool. Um, they don't live around here. Um, it's normally ones that come up from Scotland, um, travel down, have a bit of a summer holiday and then head back up again. And they have a really varied uh, lifespan. Around 20 years is the lower end. And then orca, I think there was an orca called Granny who died at 115 years old. So their lifespan is really varied. Focusing more on the cetaceans that we get in Sussex. <clears throat> so we get quite, a, we get four species of cetacean. Um, the one that we get most reported is the bottlenose dolphin. If my video is gonna work. Um, now they're mostly reported inshore between May and September. Um, they follow the fish um, down into the up into the shallower water, but they are seen offshore all year round. Um, they can be really, really close inshore, um, up to kind of 10, 15 meters inshore. Um, they've scared quite a few swimmers, particularly off Brighton and Hove. Um, they're usually in pods of between eight to 15. Um, we do get the occasional lone dolphin. They're normally quite recognizable. Uh, we have one particular one called Floppy Fin, who comes in every summer um, and he really enjoys interacting with um, people on jet skis and, and uh, stand up paddle boards as well. Um, but he'll come in on his own and then disappear off and join a pod and then come back a week or two later. So he's kind of like the scout. Uh, I have a video, I think. You know what? So this video was taken in September and it's just off Shoreham Beach. Not the best video of the dolphins, but I think it's quite good to be able to see how close they are to shore um, and prove that it, it kind of is Shoreham Beach as well. So this was a pod of eight um, who spent three or four days traveling up and down the coast uh, between Shoreham um, and Rye. And then they headed back out west again um, and went off to Cornwall. So the second species that we get, um, which is not as common in Sussex, they come around more in August and September time when the water's a lot warmer. Um, I say they're a bit of a wimp. Um, <laughs> these are common Atlantic dolphins or short-beaked Atlantic dolphins. They look very different to the bottlenose. You can see they have that really lovely showing off view nicely there. Um, hourglass pattern on their side going from a a tan or yellow fading into a pale gray and they have that really dark back and a slightly taller dorsal fin than the bottlenose dolphins as well. Um, <clears throat> that uh, footage was actually taken just the side of Portsmouth um, and the photograph is from Cow Gap and that was this year uh, which is really really cool. Um, they're only about two and a half meters long um, I've got the bottlenose dolphins that we just saw can get up to four meters long in Sussex. So they're, they're really quite big animals. Um, the common dolphins love to play and bow ride with boats. They're quite acrobatic. Uh, they're the ones that we most often see kind of leaping and jumping around and showing off um, when we get videos of them. Um, so they're, again, they're a really cool species. This, we, this species is one that we get less items of inshore. They're a deeper water species. Um, so they tend to be kind of outside the 12 mile limit. We quite often get footage from offshore fishermen um, and people crossing the channel. Um, these guys are quite often mistaken for orca. Um, they are quite large. They're, they're more chunky than the bottlenose in the common Atlantic. Um, and they have the similar gray saddle patches behind the dorsal fin as killer whales do. Um, but they're not orca. They're really, really chunky. They're really fast. These are one of the fastest species that we have. Um, they have a really, really powerful tail fin. And unlike the bottlenose, we don't think they go after schooling fish as much. They go after um, kind of individual fast swimming fish, which is why they have that really powerful tail muscle. Um, in order to be able to do fast bursts of speed. And last but not least, my personal favorite is our little harbor porpoise. Uh, these guys only get up to about 1.8 meters in length and that's the maximum for an adult male. So they're not very big. They're re normally really, really elusive, really shy. Um, they disappear at the sound of boat engines. Um, 
but actually we think we have a semi-resident pod um, along the Seven Sisters, uh, particularly between um, Beachy Head and Cook Mayhaven. That's a, a really good hotspot for them. Um, and they've actually seemed to have um, developed a, a tolerance for boats, particularly for the kind of the tour operators that go out of there. Um, and we have some really lovely footage from um, Maverick boats. So you can quite clearly see we're not faking this is Sussex. <laughs> Beachy Head Lighthouse is fairly distinctive. Um, but yeah, they've developed a, a really unusual tolerance. Um, normally they disappear, but um, the boat operators around uh, that leave from, normally from New Haven, um, they've learned that if they turn their engines off, the harbour porpoises tend to stick around. Uh, so there's about six in this group. And again, they hang around inshore and they're quite visual um, in the summer and they kind of head in and out in the winter. So we do get some winter sightings, um, but especially when the sea is choppy, these guys are really, really hard to see. Um, so it's not surprising that we don't get many visual sightings of them over the winter. We've actually developed a relationship with an organization called Trelonia, um, who's going to lend us their, some of their hydrophones so that we can listen to them in the winter. Um, because we don't know anything about where they go in the winter, having these um, acoustic devices in the water will be able to tell us not only when we have dolphins and porpoises in the area, but it can also pick up what species they are, um, whether they're communicating or whether they're hunting. So it's going to be really, really, really interesting to see, um, see the results of that. We already have a couple in um, in Selzy, so they're part of the Cetacean Acoustic Trend Tracking Program, um, and they're also being used by Sussex IFCA for, for using fish tracking as well. So these devices are really cool, and hopefully we're going to get so much more information um, over the next few years about what's happening with our dolphins when we can't see them when they're under the water. So. Aside from collaborations with other research organisations, um, we do a lot of work with citizen science. So we have a public sightings database, um, which we use for um, recording where our dolphins are going, basically. Um, so this is sent out to everybody. We ask everyone to record um, if they see a, a dolphin or a porpoise, either from land or um, when they're out on the water. We have a report of sightings form on our website, or you can phone up our, our mobile number and leave the details on there. Um, it's really, really important that we get as much data as possible, um, not only so that we can protect the animals, but also because their apex predators, understanding them will help us to understand the health of our entire marine ecosystem. Um, so knowing how well they're doing, where they're feeding will help us to understand um, where the good places are, if that makes sense, and what places um, may need a little bit more restoration or um, when we've got good fish populations coming back, etc. cetera. Um, so this dolphin distribution map uh, was created last year. Um, by our fantastic research assistant, Hannah. Um, she was at Brighton University and she did this as part of her dissertation. Um, so um, it's a bit blurry on our screen. I don't know how good it is on yours, um, but you can see that we've got some real hot spots along Brighton, Hove and Worthing, going into Shoreham as well. Um, a bit of a gap around Littlehampton and then picking up again towards Bognor Regis. Um, we think Bognor has a good population because there's a quite a lot of rocky ground out there, which is good for um, for the bottlenose when they're when they're looking for food, basically. Um, and the the, the kind of the shelving um, bathymetry of Brighton and Hove means that particularly when um, species like mackerel are coming inshore, uh, the bottlenose dolphins actually use the bottom of the seabed to chase the mackerel into shallow water so that they can hunt them easier. Um, they're really intelligent. It's really cool data. And hopefully, again, as we go through the years, um, we'll be able to see whether this changes at all, um, what the dolphins are doing and where they're going. So to in order to help us with that, 
um, we launched our Landwatch training scheme um, this last year now, 2023 now, aren't we? Um, and we first launched them in July. And so far we've trained over 40 Landwatch volunteers um, who go out and collect data for us. Um, we ask that people do the training first, just so that we know that everyone knows what they're looking at um, and that they know how to survey correctly. Um, and we basically teach you about the dolphins, about the species, what I what we're looking at to ID them, do a bit of distance sampling training. Um, and basically this data is already being used for our Harbour Corpus database um, to collect some really, really useful data. One of the less joyful parts of my job um, is talking about the threats to particularly our bottlenose dolphins um, off the Sussex coast. Um, and one of the biggest threats to our dolphins is super trawlers or factory ships. Now, these guys fish outside the 12 mile limit. They're not the, um, the local inshore fishermen um, and they are, they are big. We're talking with the biggest one that we have um, is about 144 meters long. Um, so they are absolutely enormous and capable of catching hundreds of tons of fish a day. And we're not only talking about the size of the boat, but the size of the net is absolutely insane. Um, so not only is this bad for the dolphins, the dolphins obviously they're hunting the same fish um, and they get they get caught up in the net. Um, it's also bad for, for the rest of the marine ecosystem. Taking out this much um, from the food web is not good for anything or anyone, really. Where are we? So you can see here the, the dotted black line that kind of traces the coast. Um, that's the 12 mile limit. So these guys fish anywhere outside of that, including over several marine protected areas. Um, so that's that's something we're having a real issue with at the moment. Um, I, only one of these super trawlers is actually flagged to the UK. The rest of them land the entirety of their catch um, that they catch from UK waters uh, in the Netherlands. So <clears throat> not only is it bad for uh, our dolphins, it's bad for our economy as well. So we're asking um, people to help us. We have a campaign going. Um, we're asking for people to, to sign the petitions. Predominantly what we're calling for at the moment is for um, remote electronic monitoring. So at the moment, they're all saying, no, we don't catch any bycatch, um, but all the data that we have is self-reported. So they have to voluntarily tell the MMO when they catch a dolphin, porpoise, seal, shark, anything. Um, so naturally, it's quite easy for them to hide when they've been catching uh, things that they shouldn't because it might have a negative impact um, on their ability to fish here. So we're asking for remote monitoring so they can't do that anymore so that we can actually see what's coming on board, what's coming out of the nets because um, the numbers don't add up. Uh, we want to make the records publicly available so that people can do research on them um, and everyone can see what they're doing. Um, and also to share the data that they've submitted to sustainable seafood, seafood certifications. So some of these super trawlers are actually certified as sustainable by the MSC, um, the Marine Stewardship Council, which not only surprised us, but we also found out that according to the MSC, they are still allowed to actively target and kill marine mammals if it means that they can catch food from it, or catch fish from it. Um, so that was disgusting. Um, and we're, we're actively asking for people to help us support our campaign. Uh, we've already had over 126,000 people now sign it uh, so we can get this discussed in government um, and hopefully get some better protection for our, our marine environment. Mm -hmm. um, other actions. So as I said, these guys are not our local inshore fishermen. Um, we are asking if anyone does eat fish, please make sure it's local and sustainable. Um, people, uh, you have a great fish stand at Bognor. Um, a lot of fishermen, um, if you contact them, they will sell the fish either directly off their boat um, or there's local fish stalls with, that actually, actually sell local fish. Um, and try something new. Everyone wants the normal cod or pollock or haddock. Um, there's so much good seafood out there. 
um, that's, <laughs> that's caught locally, sustainably, uh, with fisheries that are trying to reduce their bycatch. Um, so if you do have to eat fish, if it's a good protein source for you, um, please make sure that you do it locally, sustainably, and with fishermen that care as well, because most of our local inshore guys do. Um, so this is something we've been working on with some of our local guys. Um, it's the Clean Catch Initiative, which is run by DEFRA and CFAS. Um, there's, there was a, they run workshops every few years where local um, conservation organisations um, and fishermen go and we basically chat about what needs to be done, what progress is being made and how we can work together rather than fighting against each other. Um, and it's actually been some really, really, really good uh, solutions to mitigating bycatch, particularly in set nets um, in the gillnet fishery. Um, so we're really hopeful that soon we're going to be able to have an actual sustainable um, gillnet fishery. Um, and join us. Uh, we run boat trips um, May to September. Um, as some of you know, living on the coast, it's not very nice out there in the winter. So we run trips during the summer. Um, the trips run um, from Brighton and from New Haven. So each trip has a wildlife guide and we do a talk on what you're seeing, the work we do, um, why we do it, and hopefully try and spot some wildlife along the way. Um, my favorite trip's got to be the Seven Sisters one. It's on a rib, so it's a little bit closer to the water than our Brighton one. Uh, but you get to go and see the Seven Sisters cliffs from a different perspective. Um, and you've got the Kittiwake colony and the cormorants and quite often a couple of seals. And it goes to our Harbour Porpoise hotspot as well. Um, so that's a really, really cool trip. Um, yeah, so the Ross Anne is the one that goes from Brighton um, and the, the one on the right is the rib that goes from New Haven. Um, and we're also always looking for people who'd like to volunteer with us. Um, Landwatch is what we're most looking for at the moment. So our Landwatch training sessions will be starting again, hopefully in April, once the weather calms down a bit. And we're looking for people to do surveys um, along Southwick and Shoreham. Uh, we also run events across Sussex. Um, we do beach cleans, we go to schools, do education. Um, so yeah, we're, we're asking for anyone that would be interested um, in volunteering or have any suggestions of places that might be interested in working with us. And that's it from me. I don't, oh, I did that quite quickly. Half an hour, that's short for me. <laughs> you did indeed, thank you so much. Do you want to um, go back to uh, stop sharing your screen and then yep. you can open up to questions. There we are. I guess it's um, if people would like to um, uh, uh, share their videos um, and 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 ask away. Can I? I'll make I'll, I'll make a start. Um, what impact are you hoping, expecting the Sussex kelp restoration project to have on 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 cetaceans in our area? So I know it can be quite controversial the kelp restoration project, um, but we're we're really hoping that. Um, the increase in biodiversity that will come from the restored kelp beds um, not will bring in um, fish such as the, the pollock and the whiting and the bibs um, that the dolphins are feeding on. So we're hoping that it should we should start having more inshore sightings um, throughout the year rather than just in the winter. Um, and not only that, once the once the kelp beds are, are up and going, there'll be a, a good nursery ground for these important fish species as well. And we're hoping to see a good spillover effect. So um, fish from the kelp restoration area will start, you know, overspilling um, and also helping to support the other local marine ecosystems as well. Thank you. Anyone else? Gabe? Um, that was really interesting. Thank you so much. I, I really like the video clips as well, and it'll encourage me to go and uh, look out for some more cetaceans along our coast. Um, I saw what you said about eating sustainable fish. What else do you think we can do, just ordinary people? What can we do to help these lovely creatures? Um, I mean, the biggest one is um, 
eat sustainable seafood. Um, bycatch is the biggest issue in Sussex. Um, I mean, there's also all the other issues such as uh, pollution. Pollution's a big one. Um, so simple things such as try and make sure that um, you're using eco-friendly dishwashing detergent, toilet cleaner, etc. Anything that might end up, especially with uh, Southern Water's reputation at the moment, anything that might end up in the sea, um, make sure it's, it's eco-friendly. Um, obviously, try and cut, cut down your use of plastics. Um, clean up any litter because we have seen um, dolphins that have either ingested or been tangled up in plastic um, off Sussex as well. Thank you. Really interesting. Any Anyone else? Any questions? No? Well, if that's the case, um, I'd just like to say on behalf of the Shoreham Society, um, that was absolutely fascinating. And I'm, I'm definitely thinking about a boat trip next year and I'll sign the petition, which I have. Amazing, please do. <laughs> if anyone has any questions that they think of afterwards, um, I think my, Annie, you've got my email. Um, so yeah, anyone can just ping me an email if you've got any questions um, and I'm always more than happy to answer them. That, that will be brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, and it's Friday evening. Enjoy your evening, everyone. And I'll, I'll close the meeting. You too. Bye. Have Bye. a lovely weekend, everyone. See you again. Bye.